It's a pleasure to introduce Sharon Thomas, a consultant at the Instructional Coaching Group and a co-author of our book on the Instructional Playbook, now doing a lot of work constructing a book about evaluating coaching. Um, Sharon's uh, presented uh, around North America and uh, is a spectacular presenter. Um, she's basically won every teaching award you can get in Maryland when she was a teacher, a secondary school teacher there teaching English. And uh, Sharon, um, she just has a deep sense of what's right and what's wrong. And uh, she really lives out uh, a life in support of, of doing good by other people. And uh, I was doing research on why people become teachers and what makes people be great. And I just was interviewing people. My first person I interviewed was Sharon. And I kept trying to get her to work for us because I was so impressed by all of her strengths. And um, she was always kind of like, you know, I sounds great, but I really love teaching so much. I just, I just can't think of myself as not teaching. But then it turned out there were a few changes in uh, her environment, and uh, eventually we were lucky enough to have her come and work with us. And she's brilliant and deeply knowledgeable and uh, deeply committed to doing what's right and a kind person with a warm heart. And uh, I know you're going to really love listening to Sharon Thomas. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharon Thomas, and I'm a senior consultant with the Instructional Coaching Group. I'm here today to present a session to you called um, ICG Coaching Certification, The Reboot. We've had a coaching certification program at ICG for the past three years, and those two cohorts of candidates were our pilot cohorts. Uh, we have learned so much from them and so much during those first three years of the certification process that now we are relaunching the process. We've rewritten it, we've written, rewritten the scoring guidelines, rewritten the portfolio directions, rewritten um, the standards, or I shouldn't say we've elaborated on the standards in a way that we hope is much more candidate friendly and is much more effective in communicating not only what coaching certification is, but also communicating what research-based instructional coaching is. So I'm gonna be giving you an overview over the next hour and 15 minutes or so about what that process looks like, what its purpose is, and what we hope it does for both coaches, the teachers they work with, and the students that those teachers work with. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you now so that you can see what I'm talking about. If you have the handout that came available with your conference materials, um, you'll see that this particular one is a copy of these slides. Um, because this is a little different than one of our regular workshop oriented breakout sessions, I wanted you to have the slides with these um, statements on it if you're considering going through certification or you supervise coaches and you are considering as a district having some or all of your coaches go through this process. Um, this presentation as well, once the TLC conference is over this year, it will be uploaded onto our certification webpage on our website, instructionalcoaching.com so that it can be housed there as a sort of webinar for future candidates as well. So at ICG, you know, our tagline on everything we do is excellent instruction every day in every class for every student. That's what we want. We don't want um, what a student's outcomes determined by where they live geographically, where they are socioeconomically, and so forth. And we want to ensure the quality of their learning experience every single day. We believe that instructional coaching is one of the best ways for that to happen. But it's also true that the term instructional coaching has been defined to mean so many different things that what the research says about what kind of coaching is most effective, not only to help improve teachers, but also to help improve their students, and most importantly their students, that that gets lost in all the different duties that coaches are assigned. So this issue of uh, trying to improve outcomes for students means that we have a responsibility to communicate what the research says about instructional coaching to ensure that coaching has the greatest impact that it can have. So first I'm gonna give you some contact information for me. Our uh, mother website there is instructionalcoaching.com. We do have a certifications page on there that I mentioned where you add a backslash and certifications to that. We also have a YouTube channel that includes many short video clips of my boss, Jim Knight, talking about different elements of instructional coaching, 
different elements of better conversations and partnership and you know and just ethics surrounding education out there that can be very helpful especially if you're in a position where you need to communicate any of this information to other people those video clips can be a short and engaging way of doing that um, we're also out on Twitter. Instructional Coaching Group is out on Twitter. Um, I believe that Twitter handle is Coaching PD. Um, but it, you, if you don't already follow Jim out on Twitter, he's Jim Knight 99, and I am SLT Teach Coach. The hashtags we're f uh, following to see what people are posting about this conference are TLC 2020 and Better Leaders. If you're watching this later after that conference as a webinar, but you do want to post about it and post your work toward certification, you can use our typical hashtag that we use, which is instructional coaching. So in talking about this issue of instructional coaching, that issue I mentioned earlier of having so many different definitions and perceptions is one that creates a lot of difficulty in making sure that coaching programs are in alignment with the research on what makes coaching most effective. Um, Atul Gawande, who is not in the education field, but is a surgeon at Harvard and somebody who often writes for The New Yorker, he himself has been coached as a surgeon, and he says that coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. We agree completely, and we've both faced those words done well there because having so many definitions and perceptions about that word coaching means that so many times the job descriptions for particular instructional coaches are not at all in alignment with what the research says, not because of anything intentional, but because often people don't understand what research-based instructional coaching means. What does coaching look like when it has the most important and powerful impact on students? So in terms of this certification process and trying to be that communication tool about coaching and bring about those most positive outcomes for kids. What do I mean when I say this is a reboot and that we're redoing this? Well, um, in these past three years, watching our two pilot cohorts of candidates go through the process, their feedback and questions have been so incredibly important. Probably some of the biggest information pieces that have driven the revamp of the process. Um, but there are other folks who've been involved as part of that as well. Um, our consulting team, those of us who go out and do the work um, along with Jim out in with districts out all over the world. Um, so that is Jim. It's also Ann Hoffman, Michelle Harris, and myself going out and working with districts and what we see in terms of misconceptions people have about coaching, misconceptions people had about certification, and so forth. The pilot cohort, as I mentioned, those candidates were so incredibly flexible and positive and forgiving during this pilot phase, and we can't state enough how important they've been to this process. We also have had a team of portfolio scorers working with us to score the portfolio entries, and um, they have provided also really important feedback in terms of being able to come fresh to the process in a way that I can't, um, having been part of the original um, development of it. And they are fabulous in terms of helping to see the way things are phrased and how that can change interpretation of directions, how that can change interpretation of what the score should be. So their support, those instructional coaches on the ground functioning as scorers, they've been terrifically helpful. And then finally, we did reach out to the Educational Testing Service a couple of years ago. Um, Laura Hullinger, specifically with that organization, and their team of assessment design experts who met with us at our request to talk about our scoring processes. And what that conversation led to was not only them giving us a great deal of um, important reflection and guidance on how to create more effective scoring processes, but also in, in, that, in the interest of that, in helping us develop the scoring better, they gave us some tools for how they think through that system and, that helped us to rethink the whole process in a new way, which was incredibly valuable. And so also their just positive support and collegiality was just amazing. So we so appreciate their input. Now, as I talk through what all of that input led to today, we're gonna to talk about it in three pieces. First, what's the purpose of ICG coaching certification? Second, what are those key research-based components of coaching um, for which the candidates have to provide their evidence as part of their portfolio entries? 
And finally, what are some of the practical matters and logistics surrounding certification that people ask us about most frequently? So that if you're considering candidacy for yourself or for coaches that you work with, you would feel like you've got as much information as you need in order to make the best decision for that. So first part of the program is what's the purpose of ICG coaching certification? Well, I've alluded to quite a bit of this already. Our first goal is to communicate the research about what works in instructional coaching. Not just what works for teachers, but what works for students. How do you make sure that coaching has an impact on students? Second of all, we want to provide coaches with a way to demonstrate their accomplished coaching practice. I went through the national board process many years ago, and I was very grateful to have some way to challenge myself against a set of very rigorous standards in a way that enabled me to see, am I doing this? Am I doing what students need me to do in order for them to have the best possible outcomes? We want to provide coaches with that same kind of process as well, to, to be able to put themselves up against that challenge, up against that set of standards, and see, how am I doing? Where can I improve? What do I still need to work on moving forward in order to do the best job I can by all of the people in the school? And then finally, to ensure that coaching has the greatest possible influence on students. That when we talk about instructional coaching, we want coaches to be able to know and understand the ways that it connects directly to students in a way that they can demonstrate that that's what's happening in their buildings. And that way, everybody in the building is growing from coaching, not just the teacher, not just the coach, but most importantly, students. So I'm going to start before I give you a definition of what our certification program is, I'm going to talk about what it's not. And this is based on the most common misconceptions we saw during the first two years of the pilot. And all of these misconceptions were very understandable because that word certification is used in many ways, just as the word coaching is used in many ways. Um, so there are some certification programs that are out there that are courses that someone takes, often online. Um, and so they take an online course on a particular topic. At the end, they get a certificate of completion for that. And so the program may be called a certification program. Um, there are other times where a workshop may end in the receiving of a certificate, and that is considered a certification workshop. But we're not talking about that kind of certification. Ours is most analogous to the national board certification process for teachers in that it is not designed to be a training program for new coaches. Just as new teachers can't register for national board certification, new coaches cannot either. Um, that was not a requirement in the first two years of the process um, because we didn't realize how much that would be a misconception. And what ended up happening was we had many people who were either registered themselves or were registered by their bosses where they wanted their new coaches to go through this as the training process for them. In most cases, most of those coaches who registered with thinking that that's what it was um, ended up withdrawing from the process, um, which was absolutely fine. Um, and because it just wasn't the right fit for them. In some cases, new coaches hung in there and it doesn't mean that they couldn't achieve certification um, what, but it did mean on our end that we saw a significant difference in how they were interpreting the process and how they were interpreting evidence that made it a very different process for them. Now, as part of pilots of anything, if you've ever piloted anything, you know those are much more flexible, um, much less punitive than when the program is going full steam. And so our score, scoring processes were also that way. We weren't going to punish someone with a lower score because of something we didn't communicate as effectively as we should have. But with the new process, now that we've got our scoring act together, um, scoring is going to be more rigorous along with the um, directions and the standards themselves being more rigorous. And so that would be an important misconception to know right out of the gate, which is that it's really not for new coaches. And there is the requirement that it, the person have been full-time coaching for at least two full years before registration now. Um, it's also not a train the trainers program. We did have some people who um, thought that if they achieved ICG coaching certification, that meant they could work as a consultant on our behalf, presenting this information to other people. And that's not the case either. Um, Jim had tried to train the trainers program for his work um, many years ago, and that didn't turn out very well in terms of 
um, the consistency of how the information was conveyed. And so there are actually only three people who are authorized to present the material on Jim's behalf, and that is Anne, Michelle, and myself. And so we feel like now we've got to communicate very directly that that's not what it is, because we would understand the appeal um, of it for some folks if they felt that it could lead them to other work, um, but it's not train the trainers. And then finally, um, it is not a course on instructional coaching. Um, it's not designed to be an introduction to the impact cycle or an introduction to better conversations. This process assumes that the coaches already know what those things are and are doing them, um, are implementing those ideas in their coaching when they're working with teachers. So it's not at all meant to be introductory. Okay, so what is it then? If I've told you what it's not, what is it? Um, the ICG coaching certification process is a demonstration of excellent current coaching practice. So just as national board certification is a demonstration of current accomplished coaching or current accomplished teaching practice, um, ours is parallel to that for coaches. And so it is grounded by the research-based dialogical partnership model of coaching that is known as the impact cycle. And so that is grounding this process. That is um, where the overwhelming majority of research is on instructional coaching. And so, as I said, the process is assuming that coaches know what the impact cycle is and they are implementing it with teachers and having success with that, with students and teachers. So when we talk about this reboot issue, as I mentioned, we had those first two candidate cohorts and they've been providing that continuous feedback along the way. Uh, both feedback I've asked them for and that they've offered as well, very helpfully. And then finally, um, one of the, some of the last folks I asked for their feedback on this new version before I gave it over to our webmaster to upload onto the website um, are uh, six people who did certify. Um, they were all part of that very first cohort of candidates and they achieved um, certification and were voluntarily um, read over the, this final draft of it before we cleaned it up and launched it. And their comments, the comments of those six certified coaches were incredibly valuable too. Very specific, very helpful, caused us to rethink pieces of that. And in fact, caused me to delete a whole chunk of stuff um, that was on there as well. So thank you so much to them if they end up being able to um, watch this session at some point. So when we talk about this issue of trying to measure coaching success, that is as complex as talking about measuring teaching success or measuring principal success. Because there, of course, in all of those roles in a school, there are so many different things that go into what makes someone effective in that role. And when we worked with the educational testing service on scoring, they first started talking about assessing job performance in that way by using these terminologies um, that we've got here up on the board where they said, not everything that's important in that job can be assessed. And not everything that can be assessed in that job is important. And that what you've got to figure out are, what are the most important functions of that job that contribute to success? And then of those, what are the ones you could actually assess and score as objectively as possible to make it fair for everyone. That is a very difficult proposition, especially when you consider um, how many different ways that coaches have to, for example, communicate with people. They're communicating with teachers, they're communicating with administrators, administrators, they're communicating, communicating with students and district leaders. Um, they have so many different ways that they operate within the building. Well, then what do we mean by communication then? How do we measure that? So we thought, going into the initial certification process, that we could measure a variety of those different things, and it turns out we can't. We did have to narrow it down to what are the most important aspects of communication for a coach, and let's try and measure those in various situations, for example. Um, in the impact cycle, there are a lot of moving parts as part of any impact cycle, as impact cycle coaches know. And so what are the most important ones for us to be able to see on video what are the most important ones for us to have data for on paper? Um, and which ones, while they may be important, are not able for us to objectively assess. So whenever you look at the national board process, after reading that, you might say, well, but that's not everything a teacher does. 
That's right. There are things that are not on there, either because they're not as important as some of the other items or because you can't objectively assess them. So this new version is aiming to focus solely on those most important facets that are also able to be assessed objectively. All right, so what do we mean when we talk about the key research-based components of coaching that candidates must provide evidence for? You're about to see a very fast version of uh, reviewing the second seven success factors. So here we go. If you want to read more about these seven success factors that serve as the standards for this process, there are multiple posts on them on RadicalLearners.com, both written by Jim on his blog and also me writing blogs for his um, Radical Learners blog as well. So um, I believe there's a series of them that I wrote after the first year of certification where there are seven different blogs, one on each success factor and one on things we learned by seeing people submit entries in that vein. Because the original process had seven portfolio entries, one for each success factor. And so I was able to write blogs for uh, one for each success factor about what we learned. The new process is different. There's two portfolio entries and I'll explain why later. But those two portfolio entries are measuring these seven together. So there are the seven listed there. I'm gonna take them one by one and give you a very brief overview of them. And then we're gonna to get to those specifics about the new process. So the impact cycle, um, and I decided to put some optional resources up here. Um, there are no hidden fees. There's no required PD, no required text. As I said, we think probably most people who are interested in this process already have this book. But in case you don't, um, I wanted to put optional resources up there if you wanna get those as part of investigating certification. But the impact cycle defines coaching in this way. Notice the verb there is partner. So instructional coaches partner with teachers to analyze current reality in the classroom. In other words, in the area where the teacher is concerned about students, they help the teacher to collect possibly and analyze data about what's really going on with the students. Then using that information, the coach assists the teacher in setting a goal that is really compelling for the teacher that they really want to work on deeply and also that um, is going to be powerful for the students. Then once that goal is set, the teacher is going to choose which teaching strategy they want to use in order to try to hit that goal, often with the help of an instructional playbook, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then the coach is going to help them to understand that strategy deeply by explaining it to them with the use of checklists, and if the teacher would like modeling of that strategy, by modeling it for them in the classroom. And then finally, the coach is gonna provide support on hitting that goal with the kids until that goal is met. So the teacher is gonna set that goal, the two, the coach and the teacher are gonna work on that as much together as the teacher wants until the students hit that goal. Notice that the goal is focused on the students. It's not focused on the teacher. It's not looking at the teacher in a deficit kind of way. It's saying, here's where the students are. Where do we need them to be in this area? And moving them toward that. And so I've blocked off here, and this is sort of a um, fundamental way of viewing the new process. Fundamentally, entry one is about demonstrating that you are doing those four things well. Um, those four things on that list there are the impact cycle. And so entry one says, show us that you're doing the impact cycle well. Entry two is about the issue of partnership. It's about creating that collaborative culture in the building through all the different ways and all the different people with whom the coach has contact as part of implementing instructional coaching. So this is a way to think about how we reframed the seven success factors. Entry one deals with the bullet list that's part of the definition. Entry two deals with that partnership verb that's part of the definition. So the impact cycle um, has three st stages to it, identify, learn, and improve. And in the certification process with entry one, the uh, coach candidates are going to first demonstrate that they know what the identify stage is and show that they do it well. They're going to show evidence that they collect um, data and analyze that data with teachers to help them set that goal for students. And then they also um, provide the teacher with choices in picking a strategy to hit that goal and then move into the learn phase in order to clearly describe that goal by using checklists 
and uh, Atul Gawande's book on checklists is a terrific resource to think about checklists, and that they also offer the option of modeling. As part of the certification process, the teacher does, need the, the impact cycle teacher that's chosen for this entry to be the focus of the entry, they do need to allow the coach to model that because that is an evidence piece we have to see, is the coach modeling the strategy in one of these um, six ways. And then finally, that moves us into the improve phase, where now the teacher is implementing the strategy in order to hit that goal with students in the area that the teacher has identified for them to improve. And that involves not necessarily steps or stages, but parts. Um, the idea of confirming direction, in other words, periodic check-ins to see how the teacher's doing, how are things are going. Also to specifically review progress, both at the micro level of how students are doing on the goal, but also at the macro level of what's the teacher learning about the students or about the content or about behavior um, or what is surprising them in terms of what's going on. What are some of the challenges the teachers run into? Um, also, then you can, um, if there are challenges and the plan needs to be changed, as it often does, because the real world can cause us to revise our plans, um, inventing improvements, either to the strategy, to the goal, um, to the measurement of the goal, that are going to help the students to keep moving forward and improving. And then finally, planning next actions. So if the teacher has hit the goal, do they want to pick another goal to work on for improvement with their students? Or if the goal has become particularly um, time consuming or um, taking much longer for progress to happen, what does the teacher want to do in that situation? So all of those are different components of improve, um, some of which the coach will demonstrate on um, entry one. So with that impact cycle, it's important for us to see that. It is the um, element of certification, entry one, has the largest number of evidence pieces because that's the stuff the research says coaches need to be doing the majority of their work time if the coaching role is supposed to be moving students. If the coaching role is supposed to be something else, if it's designed to be quasi-administrative and so forth, then our um, coaching process probably isn't for that kind of coach. But if it is supposed to be instructional coaching that has an impact on students, then the demonstrating um, excellence in these three phases is critical. So we do have a new and improved coaching uh, cycle checklist, impact cycle checklist, that is available on instructionalcoaching.com. Um, this has been revised just in the last several months. Um, the old one is still fine, that came with the reflection guide for the impact cycle when it was first released three years ago. Um, but this one's better, and it's also very um, pretty in color. <laughs> so if you want to use that as a way of seeing how much of your role or how much of your coach's roles um, align with this, that can be a helpful indicator of how challenging it might be for them um, or how simple it might be for them to come up with evidence pieces in these categories. All right, so the second success factor is that of an instructional playbook. And I mentioned that an instructional playbook is very helpful in giving teachers choices in choosing a strategy to hit the goals they have for students. So toward the end of the identify phase, the coach, when having the goal setting conversation with teachers, once the teacher has set their goal for the way they want the students to improve, the coach is going to ask the teacher, is there a strategy you want to use for this? Oftentimes, the coach says, I've tried everything, I, or the teacher says, I've tried everything I know to help kids improve here. You know, what do you have um, that I could use? And that's the time where the coach can offer choices. We know the central importance of offering choices instead of advice or mandates or requirements. When strategies are offered as a choice, it's going to engage the teacher more deeply in working on that strategy and wanting to still stick with it when times get tough and implementation and so forth. So having choices available instead of just a go-to particular strategy is incredibly valuable and is much more likely to ensure the success of coaching for the kids. Um, we have recently written a book about this topic to help districts who want to create instructional playbooks. There is some information in the Impact Cycle book itself on this, uh, but if you haven't created one yet and you want um, something that is um, clear and explains what that process looks like and is also much less expensive than bringing one of us out there for a workshop on it, the instructional playbook book might be a helpful optional resource for you. So what is it? What is instructional playbook? 
Of course, we know from its use in sports that typically they are plays that the players have run over and over again in practice so that in the, under the pressure of game day, um, when someone calls out that play, whether it's a quarterback or a coach or whomever, the players know it so automatically they can go right to it. Same idea for coaches. Setting goals for students in an area where teachers are frustrated is a stressful conversation to have. When the teacher chooses a goal area that's one of the most common ones the coach encounters, and it usually is, um, then they automatically have choices to go to in their playbook to offer that teacher. So it, it starts at that end of the identify phase during the part of choosing the strategy in order to figure out how to get from where students are starting to hitting that goal. And it's got three components to it. Unlike most educational resources that come in a binder this thick or in a resource box this deep along with a huge website and so forth, things that are probably really valuable but that no one's ever got time to sift through, um, an instructional playbook should be lean and clean. If you can get that thing into a half inch binder, you're doing really well. If you can get it into a folder, you are just acing it it's amazingly. Um, it, as lean as it is, that's the more useful and helpful it's going to be. So the first page of it is a table of contents of the categories of the areas where people ask the coach for the most support that year. This particular year, I would imagine some of the categories on instructional playbooks would be things like um, virtual academic achievement resources, um, virtual engagement strategies, um, you know, some of those things that are on people's minds as so many people are going to be starting the school year virtually this year. In a more typical year, you might have some categories that are about academic achievement areas. You might also have a classroom management category, a student engagement category, but they're the areas where teachers are most commonly asking you for support. Under each of those categories, you've got choices for them, different strategies you have thoroughly vetted that you know will make an impact with students in that area. So if the category is something like reading, you have a variety of literacy strategies under there that are going to be helpful to a teacher who's got students with a, who are struggling in reading in some way. Um, if it's classroom management, you've got a bunch of different classroom management um, resources, um, practices there that are going to help that teacher to improve um, their classroom management um, and the student culture in the room. So, but that table of contents should be one page and one page only in order for that resource to be helpful. For each of the strategies that are listed as choices on that table of contents, then you'll have a one page summary of each one that will provide the teacher with enough information to make a choice from among those choices. And then finally, for each of those one page summaries, um, you'll have enough checklists that the coach will already have those tools ready to explain that strategy to the teacher and to allow the teacher to modify those things according to student needs. So notice very, very lean. The third element is gathering data. Um, is the coach skilled in gathering data? Both to help decide what the goal should be if the teacher wants help with data and determining the goal for the kids, but then also um, skill in gathering and analyzing data as part of implementing the strategy and tracking the student's goal progress. And so our goal structure um, is peers. It first started out as SMART, as so many districts use, and you'll see some definite connections to SMART here, but we've modified it according to um, what the goals need to look like in order for teachers to find them compelling in coaching. So that first um, letter P is powerful for the students. Does the teacher think it's gonna make a significant difference for them to work on that? The E is easy, but not easy to hit, uh, more easy to communicate, efficiently stated, efficient in terms of is this the clearest path to get improvement in that area. Um, easy, the second E is emotionally compelling. Does the teacher themselves care about that goal and really want to work on it? That is critical according to the research on adults and change. Then um, reachable is an R version of measurable. You know, um, in, in order to have a goal, you need to be able to measure where the students started from to where they hit the goal so that you know that improvement has occurred. It's not just a perception. And then finally, um, what I consider the most important part of peers, which is student focused, that the goals start with students well, that the accountability piece is to students, um, that the focus is on students, that this is about students. It's not about fixing broken teachers, as so many um, people perceive coaching to be. 
Instead, it's about student improvement, that everybody can benefit from instructional coaching who's working with kids, and that the focus is on what do the students need to do, and that's our target, and that's the thing that we focus on. We're not focusing on strategy implementation as the goal. We're not focusing on fidelity as the goal. We're not focusing on fixing a teacher as the goal. We're focusing on student improvement. So there are, um, these are the most common areas in which goals are set in coaching. Academic achievement is obviously no surprise. Other areas that um, can be very helpful to teachers are in the area of engagement. And so if engagement has three domains, a goal could be set in any of these three domains. Behavioral engagement, or what's commonly called classroom management. Cognitive engagement, in other words, how much are students wanting to learn those academics? How much are they into the learning? And then finally, emotional engagement. Do students feel safe and ready to learn? That social emotional learning component as well. A teacher could have a coaching goal from our perspective in any of these areas. So I've got a completely non-inclusive list here of types of data that can be used as evidence in this part of the certification process. Um, you should not feel beholden to any of these though. It can very much be the case that your system has a way of measuring something like student behaviors or something like formative assessment, and summative assessments in a particular content area. That's great, but what we're looking for is that the coach is skilled in the data collection that they're doing and that they're providing the evidence of that from baseline, where the impact cycle goal starts, to achieving the goal. Hitting the goals in this section is a requirement. So the goals can't still be in progress. The goal, we need to see the evidence that the coach is helping the teachers to set and hit goals. We need demonstration that it's working, um, which is why we need the ones that are complete and that were successful. Number four um, of the seven is communication, which should, probably comes as no surprise to anybody. Communication is central in whether or not people are willing to even work with a coach, let alone to how the coaching interaction is gonna go. Um, of course, our resource in this area is Better Conversations, um, which gives a great deal of um, not only perspective on the issue of communication, uh, either personal or professional, but also some helpful strategies for improving in that area as well. So Better for Conversations has six beliefs. Um, number one, seeing others as equals regardless of their job role or assignment. Number two, not moralistically judging other people, not thinking, oh, that's a bad teacher. I need to make that bad teacher good. Or I wouldn't do it that way. That's wrong to do it that way. Um, perceiving things as differences so that you're able to move like a partner in that interaction. Um, number three, I think others should have a lot of autonomy. Remembering that no one has total autonomy in this world, but trying to maximize as much autonomy with adults as possible. Number four, um, believing what, wanting, wanting to hear what others have to say, uh, being genuinely interested in what's going on with that teacher and their students, genuinely curious about what might be at work there and what um, different possibilities are available in order for it to improve. Number five, that conversations should be back and forth, that, it sh that conversations shouldn't be designed to guide, to mentor, to advise someone to a particular action or to a to particular conclusion about a situation, but instead the approach should be that ideas are all on the table and the teacher's position as the one who decides what to do with those options and which ones to embrace and which ones to put aside. And then finally, that conversation should be life-giving. But even if it's a difficult conversation about a difficult topic, even if the conversation doesn't fix the problem per se, that everyone should feel afterwards like it was a good thing we had that conversation that we did um, understand each other better. We did get some clarity on that, or maybe some ideas about a path to improvement. Um, not that anyone felt diminished, felt less than as a result of that conversation. And so the 10 habits that go along with better conversations are the ways to try to walk the talk of those six beliefs. So if I see one of the beliefs is an area where I want to improve, I might choose one or more of the habits to focus on to try to make that happen, to make that improvement go as a coach. So here are the first five habits, and these are certain things that we'll be looking for on the videotapes, um, depending on which part of, the, of entry one it is, looking for certain habits being demonstrated. And here are the other half of the 10. 
again, some of which are, we look for um, evidence of in different pieces. And those, the ones that we're looking for evidence of in different sections, those are highlighted within that section so that the coach knows here are the ones we're really looking for in that area. That's in addition to this um, reboot that we didn't have in the first one. We actually attempted to look for the 10 habits in all of the five minute videos and that is not accessible. <laughs> That's what I mean about the difference between something that can be assessed and something that can't be. Um, and so now we've narrowed it for looking for particular ones. All right, the fifth part of the seven success factors is understanding adults and change. And uh, a resource in this area is Jim's first book on coaching, which is called Instructional Coaching. Uh, and it is uh, um, very much about this issue of partnership and about trying to lessen resistance to change, lessen resistance to being supported by another adult, both of which are things that humans naturally resist for a variety of reasons that we talk about in our workshops, um, but that are important to reduce if we want deep change to happen for kids. And so I love this quote from Brene Brown, that coaching is an art and it's far easier said than done. It takes courage to ask a question rather than give up advice, provide an answer or unleash a solution. Giving the other person the opportunity to find their own way, make their own mistakes, and create their own wisdom is both brave and vulnerable. And not only is it brave and vulnerable to let people have the space and time to do that, it's really the only way deep change happens. I think in education where uh, the sense of responsibility is so important, we feel like the change has to happen. It has to happen now. But all the evidence says that change doesn't work that way. And we've got to stop thinking that it can. And we've got to stop relying on um, processes or resources that say it can change overnight. Instead, the way it changes is by giving peace, people the time and space to change. So what does that look like then? The partnership principles um, were what Jim introduced in that instructional coaching book. And there are seven of them. And so with each partnership principle, um, the coach can kind of feel pressured to be equally amazing at all of these in all situations. And that's just not the way partnership works. Everybody has their own stuff that they need to work out and everybody has different strengths and areas for growth among these. Um, but equality means seeing people as all counting the same. People aren't the same, people are different, but we all count the same. We're all valuable on this team that's working for the best things for kids. Choice is imperative, that the more people are told what to do, the fewer choices they're given, the more they will feel like they're being treated like children. And the more their behavior will involve compliance level behavior instead of commitment level behavior. In other words, they'll do the minimum of what they've been told to do instead of deeply changing things that would be helpful for kids. Not because they're trying to be difficult, not because they don't want to do the best things for kids, but because how we approach people about issues matters. It matters deeply. And that tag teams right along with the issue of voice, that people need to feel like they have some say in how things go down in their classrooms. They, feel, they need to feel like they have some degree of autonomy over that situation and that their perspective is valued. Even if they have, don't have as much experience as the coach, even if they don't have as much skill in a particular area as the coach, they do have knowledge of those students. They do have skills and those things need to be a part of the equation. Number four is dialogue, which I already mentioned before, that idea that conversation should be back and forth, not where you're trying to guide somebody to see things a particular way. And then number five, reflection, that idea of looking back at a problem, looking at what it looks like right now, and looking ahead at what, you, at what the teacher wants it to be for students is critical in having as much information as you can about the issue to work from and about respecting that teacher's voice and perspective on the issue. Number six is praxis, which is sometimes the most controversial of the bunch because it says put the pause button on the fidelity police. And if you want someone to learn something deeply, a new program, a new strategy, whatever it is, they need the freedom to experiment with it. They need the freedom to mess around with it. But in a, something that's like inquiry-based learning for students, where they are tracking what those changes mean and whether those changes are helpful for kids. Um, but allowing the teacher to have the time and space to learn something deeply before insisting they show fidelity to it. Because as Chip and Dan Heath say, that often a lack of fidelity is not resistance. 
it's actually that the person hasn't been given enough time to learn something deeply to even know what fidelity is and what it means. Um, and then finally, number seven, reciprocity, that in partnership coaching, coaches say things like, boy, I've learned so much as a coach. If I go back to teaching, I would teach completely differently than I used to. Uh, people who are more often coaching in a top-down style, the more, the more fixer model, <coughs> excuse me, they say things like, oh, I tell them what to do a hundred times and they don't do it. Why do I care more about her keep, keeping her job than she does? Um, things that are coming from that fixer mentality um, where a partnership coach is learning just as much as the teacher is because they're open to learning it. Okay. And the sixth of the seven success factors is leadership. That this is a partnership approach. We don't want teachers feeling like the coach is a leader up here and the teacher is down here being led by the coach. Instead, we're talking about servant leadership. We're talking about partnership leadership. We're talking about instructional leadership. So just as teachers are leaders, coaches are leaders as well. And so what does that mean? Um, here are some qualities of effective, effective instructional coaches, like emotional intelligence, being able to read people, read the room, um, being responsive to teachers, having it together organizationally and so forth in terms of process, and being able to take care of themselves. Because it can be very easy for an instructional coach to feel like they have to be all things to all people all the time when that's not a reasonable expectation for anyone. And then finally, um, the issue of system support. And with system support, um, this one heavily factors into entry two. Um, a lot of the evidence we asked for in entry two goes to this issue of system support. Um, a great resource in this area is um, unmistakable impact. Jim spoke from several years ago that deals heavily with the issue of implementation and all the system factors that go into um, coaching success and instructional success. So part of this um, entry and entry two that deals with system support is the focus on surface coaching versus deep coaching. Deep coaching is the coaching that has research support saying it moves kids. That's the impact cycle. That's the, the bottom part there on the graph. On, graphic on your screen. Surface coaching is all those other goodies as a sign that coaches have to do and they're helpful to certainly to the adults in the building but don't have a strong research base saying they move kids. Things like implementation support, you know, helping teachers use a new required program or a new required textbook or something. Um, things like all the hall duty, bus duty, cafeteria duties coaches are asked to do. Um, pull out interventions for students coaches are often asked to do. Um, leading PLCs um, and not just being able to just be a member of PLCs like teachers are. All those different the substitute teaching all the time. Um, those things are surface coaching. They don't have the impact on kids. So we need evidence from that person's leader about what the coach does and doesn't do and how they're spending their time so that we know the coach is working on deep coaching on the impact cycle enough that it's making a difference. So we talk about this issue through the lens of what we call role clarity. Is it clear what the coach is and isn't supposed to do and how much of their work time they're supposed to be allotting to those duties? Um, because if the coach is intended to move students, have that demonstrable impact on student data of some kind, then role clarity is critical. To move those kids, coaches have to be working with teachers in cycles for the majority of their time. This was a big issue for many of our pilot cohort of people in our pilot cohort of candidates, they would say, well, I'm not doing that. Can I still be a candidate? Well, you can still be a candidate um, because that's not the only thing we're measuring. But if you are a candidate and you don't have that, candidacy can be the impetus for you to move to getting that, to having those conversations about the role, about the research on coaching that indicates that that's necessary for students to move. It could mean that in your first year of candidacy, maybe you just want to work on entry one with the impact cycle while you're trying to get that role clarity modified so that you can demonstrate growth in that when you submit entry two in the second year. That can be a way to handle that situation. But you need to be working toward that to be an accomplished coach because without that, it's not likely that school-wide data is moving as a result of the coach or coaches. So if it's not happening, then measuring student impact from coaching just is very difficult because you just don't have enough student focused goals in order to show the impact there. 
So there are eight facets of support from leaders that we focus on when we talk about um, principals and assistant principals and so forth, supporting coaches there. And um, in, ter in terms of what does, what, what does system support look like when the coach has it? So when the administrator is writing the evidence piece for this, and it does come very heavily from that um, coach's boss, they are attesting that these different things are in place. So is that challenging for the coach sometimes to get that evidence from their leader? It is, but we have to ask for that because our research indicates that if there isn't this multifaceted system support, then coaching has very limited success and limited impact on kids. And remember, that's what we're trying to demonstrate here is that when coaching is done well, it has a demonstrable impact on students. So yes, it's challenging, but it has to be happening for coaching to be as successful as it can be. All right, so my last piece here is gonna be about practical matters and logistics surrounding certification. Um, what a great resource for this is gonna be once we have launched the new um, materials, which at the time of TLC, they should be up on our website by then. Um, I will have also written three new blogs for, for the Radical Learners blog. Um, about these issues. So one focuses on overall certification issues, one focuses on entry one, and one focuses on entry two. Those can give you much deeper information than um, this presentation does today. So those should be up and available on our website and through radicallearners.com. So when we talk about eligibility, we've got three requirements. Number one, that the candidate now has to be employed full-time as an instructional coach for at least two full school years at the time of registration. That means two full school years by the time they register during that window between November 1st and January 31st. And we will be asking for evidence of that. Um, second, that they spend at least 60 to 70% of their work time on cycle-based partnership coaching versus all of the other duties as assigned. So the majority of what they're doing. And that they submit the registration and portfolio requirements by the specified deadlines. Um, sometimes folks will ask us for latitude on some requirements or on some deadlines. And generally speaking, we can't accommodate those requests. During COVID quarantine, which happened so incredibly fast, we did give candidates a wholesale extension um, because of that. And, and we applied it to everybody who wanted it. If you wanted an extension because of COVID, you got it, right? If we can't apply that same blanket exception to folks, then we have to decline it. So one person's individual um, needs in terms of deadlines and requirements and so forth can't be modified. It would have to be something that applies to the whole group. Because otherwise, if, they, if um, requirements and deadlines and scoring procedures, if they don't apply to the whole group, then the process itself doesn't have legitimacy. And we need it to have legitimacy to mean anything to the school districts. Um, who want their coaches to go through it. So what's the cost? Um, the cost previously was $400 per candidate. That was a shot in the dark. We had no idea how much it was going to cost um, to do scoring and so forth. Um, now that price tag is intentionally low. We do not expect ever to make a profit from certification. It's a, it's a program we want to provide because it's important to us on that communication issue with the research issue and with wanting to provide coaches with a process like this. Um, that said, we do have to cover costs of things like the scoring process. Um, we do pay scorers and so forth. So the fee based on how much that has cost us to date is now $500 per candidate, intentionally very low. So that if a candidate wants to engage in the process but they can't rely on their district or their school to pay that for them, it makes it more affordable for them to do it themselves. Um, that fee is all inclusive. There are no required purchases. There are no required workshops. There's no required trainings. Because again, since it's a demonstration of accomplished current coaching practice, you should have already had that by now, right? You're already exposed to it. Um, you already know what it is. So it's not, it's not a training module. Remember, it's not a course on instructional coaching. So there's no expectation of paying for things like that. So the registration um, for cohort three, as I mentioned, opens November 1st of this year, and we'll be advertising that on our social media pages and website, and it's going to close January 31st. 
There are all different ways to pay. Um, you can pay personally using PayPal, using your credit card, um, but there's also ways to manage things like purchase orders if a district or a school is um, paying on behalf of a group of coaches. Um, so when we talk about this issue of evidence, what do we mean? So I've mentioned entry one and entry two several times at this point, but the revised process does mean submitting two portfolio entries instead of the original seven, entry one on the coach implementing the impact cycle, entry two on the coach fostering a collaborative school culture. And so those new directions um, should be available on the website now, um, and they are much more specific, much more detailed as a result of questions from candidates in the first two pilot cohorts. I think the directions are so much clearer. Yes, they're several pages long. Um, if you look at the National Board Certification Directions, those are very long. <laughs> um, we've tried to keep them as short as possible, but we did need to give clarity um, based on the questions that we were hearing. So what is entry one? Entry one includes both the submission of video clips and print artifacts from a full start to finish to the goal is hit impact cycle interaction with a single teacher. So one teacher on that whole goal all the way across. Um, the candidates cannot submit different footage with different teachers from parts of different impact cycles. That is not helpful at all. It's gotta be one continuous impact cycle with the same person on the same goal. And also it is gonna ask for additional evidence pieces from uh, other teachers with whom the coach has had impact cycle experience with, but it's not asking for a video of them. It's asking more for documentation of their goals and goal success. Um, entry two is solely written verification. There's no videos for entry two. And that those pieces of written verification come from the coach candidate supervisor, whether that's a school principal or assistant principal, or whether it's a district level supervisor and also feedback from teachers that can connect the coach candidates coaching practice to aspects of the school culture. And again, yes, is it hard to get those pieces sometimes from people you work with. It's the same in the national board certification process. You have to get outside verification um, often of what you're submitting. Yes, that's challenging, um, but it's important because we know that these things are critical factors and whether or not coaching has an impact on students. And that's ultimately what we're measuring. So it is a three year process that can be complex to explain. So I'm going to explain it um, using scenarios um, piece by piece. This is to give candidates some flexibility in the timetable in which they submit things and collect evidence pieces. So it can take between one and three years to achieve certification, depending on what the candidate needs. So for example, in scenario one, all candidates who register by January 31st of 2021 are going to submit as many entries as they like, one, one and two, or none, by May 1st through June 15th, the submission window online of that same year. So if they want to submit something the first year, they can. So they can submit either entry one or entry two, entry one and entry two, or nothing. Whatever they submit, they're going to get those scores back for that first submission window by October 31st of, this, of the same year, 2021. If they submitted both entries and both entries meet the scoring threshold for certification, they're done. They're an ICG certified coach. Done, one and done, right? In other words, that process took one year for them. If in scenario two, though, a candidate who enrolls by January 31st of next year um, Whatever they did not submit in 2021, they must submit in 2022. So if they only submitted entry one in 2021, they have to submit entry two in 2022. If they didn't submit anything in 2021, they submit both entry one and entry two in 2022. If they only submitted entry two in 2021, they submit entry one in 2022. In other words, everything has to be submitted by that second year submission window. No exceptions to that, has to be submitted, okay? Um, by October 31st of that year, of 2022, they will get their scores. If, they, if both of their entries, whether they submitted them the first year or the second year, if both of their entries meet the scoring threshold, then they are ICG certified coaches and they're done in two years. If one or both of their entries don't meet the certification threshold, 
then that's when you have the third year. The third year is retakes only. You can't submit in year three an entry that you did not already submit in year one or year two. That's critical to understand. You can't hold off on submitting an entry in both the first two years. Everything's got to be submitted by that second year. The three-year process then is that if you submitted everything in 2022 and one or both of your entries did not meet the scoring threshold, then you can submit one or both of them, depending on which ones need improvement, by that submission window in 2023. Then you'll get your scores for that resubmitted one and combined with any that might have met the certification threshold by October 31st of that year, you'll know if you meet that threshold and get certified. If it works then, you know, you meet the threshold that year, then you're an ICG certified coach in three years. Um, if you don't meet that threshold by then, then your process has ended and to do it, uh, to become certified at that point, you'd have to reapply and start over again and in year one. So that, is, that possibility is available. You can start over again if you want to. That has happened with national award candidates um, that I know personally, um, and it can happen with coaches as well. Um, also, it's important to know too, that whether or not you achieve in year one, year two, or year three is no reflection on how excellent of a coach you are. Remember, we're looking for evidence against the standards. You may be doing things at an exceptional level, and the evidence just may not be clearly showing that. And so I know as a national board, um, coach, uh, coaching national board candidates, that people can feel like, oh, well, the ones who do it after one year, they're the really good ones. And us year two, people are in, eh, year three are in. Eh. <laughs> That's not true at all. If you're, in that, if you're an NBCT, you're an NBCT. It doesn't matter how long it took you to achieve. Um, and it's just that your evidence wasn't there. And so we give the opportunity for retakes to go back, reflect on what you'd submit the first time, and submit different evidence to be able to demonstrate that that is what's happening. There. So don't attribute any kind of star power um, to when a person achieves. Um, achieving in year one, two, or three, they're all equally awesome and fantastic. So that is all the information I'm going to be providing for you today. Um, again, going out to the website is going to provide you with an incredible amount of information that's going to be very helpful. And this um, will be posted as a webinar there after the TLC conference this year. Again, my email, Sharon at InstructionalCoaching.com, um, can be used to um, answer any of the other questions that you may have that aren't part of this or that aren't available on the website. And I really encourage you to go out to RadicalLearners.com and check out the blogs. The blogs give both myself and Jim a chance to expound in a little bit more detail on some of these issues and areas of our model and also for me to go in a little bit more deeply on certification pieces. Um, so we encourage you to check those out as well. Um, as always, when we're working with folks, we encourage a great deal of self-reflection, um, and in this case, self-assessment in terms of, is this the right process for me? Um, does my job description align with this process? Do the evidence pieces align with what I can come up with um, as part of my portfolios? So consider all this information and think about, do the requirements mesh with your district's coaching philosophy and your job description? That's incredibly important. If they don't right now, it's probably better to wait for candidacy until they do and advocate for changes to those things. Um, also, um, if you're a coach of coaches, if you're in charge of a group of coaches, do you think they benefit from this process? Because even though it's not designed to train new coaches and it's not a course on instructional coaching, anytime you're trying to demonstrate evidence against a set of standards, that's automatically a great professional learning experience in terms of where are the areas I need to improve going forward. So would your coaches benefit from um, having it for that purpose as well? And then finally, if you do want to undertake certification or you want your coaches to undertake certification, who do you need to talk about that with in order to enter the next cohort? Um, are there people who make the budget decisions? Are there people, or do you want, if you are in charge of coaches, do you want to see if they want to participate in something like this? Um, but what would that plan look like if you want to engage in it? Um, so one more time, information slide up there just to make sure you've got my contact info and also those Twitter handles and um, very helpfully that YouTube channel. I think that's probably the, um, 
the sort of underdog of all of our resources. I think it's incredibly powerful, but often people go so much to the website, they don't think to go to the YouTube page, and there's a lot out there on that YouTube page that's great. So as I close out here today, I want to thank you all so much for joining us for virtual TLC this year. Needless to say, this has been an unprecedented year for educators. And we've all been blown away by how much people have continued to want to um, invest in professional learning, not only tied to areas that directly relate to some of the challenges people are facing right now with the level of immediacy, but also just in general, still trying to improve as leaders, improve as teachers, improve as coaches, um, improve as professionals. And so, as always, it's our honor to work with you, and um, I look forward to working with any of you who decide to go down this road of certification. Yes, it's challenging, and that always can mean there's um, some degree of um, frustrations and, um, and neediness on all of our parts, um, but also we think that this can be an incredibly valuable way to demonstrate the impact of coaching, the impact of coaches, and the most powerful ways that we can support students. Thanks very much.